Welcome to the Metasploit Sprint Demo for August 22nd, 2017. It's great to have you all here. Um, here's some community stats for you. Um, so we had a lot of pull requests come in this last uh, last couple of weeks, uh, but we also closed a bunch. So we're actually down by a, a whole quarter um, for the this last sprint, which is pretty awesome. A lot of really good stuff's going into the tree. Um, tons of bug fixes, new modules, and some really cool payload updates. Google Summer of Code is coming to a close. Um, this last, next couple of weeks is going to be our final evaluation of um, the students' progress, and the students are also going to be evaluating us and sort of see how we did as far as helping them along. Uh, we had a lot of nice uh, payload improvements to the Linux stagers. Um, they're now completely reliable, meaning that they'll retry and sleep between retries so they can run in a kind of a stealthy mode. Um, they also don't crash anymore, which is a, a nice improvement, and they've all been rewritten using the Metasm uh, inline assembler, so that means it's easier to extend them. Also, Metasploitable 3 has been converted to use Chef for all its provisioning rather than running in line with Vagrant, which improves its reliability. We've also got a new Linux version that um, we're going to be uh, debuting at um, the United Conference at, um, that Rapid7 holds every year. And we're going to be running a, a, a capture the flag as well um, based on some of this code that we did over the Google Summer of Code project. Um, and so uh, I think it was a really rousing success, and I'm kind of looking forward to uh, Metasploit participating next year. We had a lot of stuff land over the last couple of weeks, 48 PRs over the last two weeks, which is about, you know, about three or four PRs every day. Um, it was a little bit clumpy, but um, we did get it in. Uh, some of the cool stuff of note that went in, uh, SMB Loris got landed. All, of course, all the resiliency support for the Linux stagers got landed. Um, we have a new um, user access control bypass um, that, that just went in. Um, this is always sort of a, a a cat and mouse game with Microsoft, and, and the latest one, of course, lets you, again, a, a elevate administrative privileges without any pop-ups for the user. Um, we have reverse and bind shells in the R programming language, which is pretty fun because uh, now Microsoft SQL also bundles R, which our Microsoft SQL enumerator can now detect. So that means that you can run R within Microsoft SQL and pop back and get a shell. Um, we have Docker um, detection, as well as LXC and InSpawn, which is uh, something that um, System D uh, includes. Um, so basically, you can tell if you're running in a container or not. Um, there's an IBM OPM admin PHP remote code execution, which is kind of neat. Um, of course, there's a lot more out there within the, the, the open admin stuff, but um, it, it's kind of neat to be able to just do a, an object injection there. Um, there's new Jenkins credential gathering code, and um, some of our existing Jenkins modules have been updated to use um, Jenkins V2's cookie support. Um, they changed their format a little bit, so we had to do a little bit some tweaks. Uh, another PR that's been kind of cooking for a while was the idea of getting rid of openness cell of the interpreter server. The interpreter server is the first thing that gets loaded whenever you inject a interpreter shell within a target system. Um, and basically by removing this, we removed about uh, four-fifths of the code out of the interpreter. Um, so it means that basically when, when staging happens, it's a lot smaller, faster, and more reliable. Um, because we removed OpenSSL, it was also good to come up with a way to do encryption um, across the wire without using OpenSSL. So we actually added something called CryptTLV, which is a way to do inline encryption at the application level of all the interpreter packets. One of the neat things this is going to add in the future is that new transports like UDP transports, um, ones over ICMP, IGMP, whatever you have that you might want to send interpreter packets over can now actually be encrypted as well. And a zillion, zillion bug fixes. Over half of the PRs that we landed over the last year were all bug fixes. Um, 50 new PRs came in over the last couple of weeks as well, so that means we're not quite keeping up with the influx, but uh, it's it's a good problem to have. Um, one of the neat things that's come in is uh, a, a re rehash of the uh, named pipe transport PR from last year. Uh, one of the big improvements of it over last year is it has automatic remote staging support, basically meaning that you can actually um, um, stage a remote interpreter via an intermediate interpreter without actually having to call back home to uh, Metasploit framework itself. Um, this also, um, part of this is, is part of work to, to make packet pivoting a first class, uh, a first class uh, construct as well. Um, and one of the neat things about this is it makes um, uh, packet pivoting without channels a lot faster, meaning there's a lot fewer round trips that have to go back and forth between Metasploit and uh, Interpreter. Um, a new driver tools loader has been pushed out by Bill Webb, um, which basically allows you to inject code into the kernel and load it via, um, via vulnerable drivers. Um, PowerShell, um, Simper Victus has been doing a lot of work with PowerShell staging um, and basically adding a lot of support for AV bypass. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, basically never allocating memory as writable and executable simultaneously, um, which is uh, some good work that's in review right now. Um, there's a QNAP uh, remote command execution um, in the in QNAP uh, transcode module. Um, we actually just got a QNAP device to, to do some testing on that. 
Um, there was a big kerfluffle about some Git bugs where basically you can do remote code execution via Git, via malicious Git repository. And so we actually have a Git simulator with an exploit that's it's in works to, um, to d exploit this module. Um, the database import module has been um, been profiled over the last few weeks, and um, we're actually hoping to show that soon. Um, maybe we'll be able to demo that today and showing some pretty awesome performance improvements. And of course, a ton of bug fixes are also in the works. Going on to talk about some of the, the specific teams within Metasploit, uh, the A team has, of course, been working on the driver tools extension for a while. Um, there's a new repo that we just published to the public. Um, basically, the, it's called the Metasploit Baseline Builder Tool. And what this does is it builds, I think, 23 different Windows VMs um, with all the different configuration settings so that when you want to do automatic payload testing, you can just build your environment all of it <laughs> directly. I just realized that that uh, van has an obscene license plate. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we added CryptTLV support to all of the uh, interpreter um, instances, which is uh, a cool thing. Um, in fact, now um, interpreters that previously couldn't support OpenSSL encryption now can actually support CryptTLV extension, such as PHP. Um, the Metasploitable 3 Capture the Flag has been under the way for a couple of weeks. Um, or not, well, not the Capture the Flag, but the development of the infrastructure for it. Look for more updates to that later. And um, also the Pro release went out with lots of bug fixes. Um, Zen Team Xenatos has been working on a variety of different things. Um, one, of course, has been the SMB2 projects going on for a while, and um, I, I think a lot of new file system operations have been added there. Um, of course, the database optimization um, uh, project has been going on there as well, and um, so we'll hopefully we'll be able to see some of that later on today. Um, Mesploit 5 pro proof of concept, we might be able to show a demo of that today. We'll, we'll have a look and see how that goes. I'm seeing some heads shaking yes, and so that's awesome. And of course, the, the metal extension letter, which allows to load extensions on OSX, POSIX, and other kinds of uh, Linux type systems. We're getting into demo time, but so I think that what we'll basically do for the next slide is we'll kind of segue from this is a, this is the project that Jen was has been working on as part of the, the database improvement project. And I thought, would you like to talk a little bit about Jen? Yeah, it's a simple, a fun project. It's a pet project for me. So basically, the idea is to create a very simple-minded database that can uh, you know deal with a large set of IP and IP import pairs. Uh, so the what got me started was that. Uh, Current uh, database which can just uh, IP import pairs at a rate of a couple of thousand per second or maybe tens of uh, thousand per second. So if we have a million uh, IP import uh, pairs in a file, it will take a couple of hundred seconds to import them. Uh, so I was thinking, uh, how do I uh, do something simple but fast? So this is fast. You can import uh, five million uh, or more uh, IP import pairs within a second. And uh, it's persistent, so all the data is written to the file. And uh, 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 operation-wise, it supports adding an IP or IP uh, port pair. And you can delete it, but there is no, nothing you can update. There's no, I don't see any need, but if it comes up, we can support that. In the future, I want to make it as a standalone service. Right now, it's a library. It's a, like a, almost like SQLite. Uh, but in the future, I want to make it a standalone service. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty interesting tool from like the Octo or Labs point of view as well, since they do the whole internet scan thing. Uh -huh. um, and so they actually have some data sets you might be able to use live uh, for importing. I think this yeah, scans.io would be where you get all the data that they find. Okay. Cool. All right. So since we're switching to demo time, um, Jen, how about I go ahead and switch you over to you? And if, would you like to show a demo, or um, sure. is that just I, kind I of a preview? I thought I was going to be the, the last one because I then last, but if you give me the first slot, I can do it. All right, go for it, man. All right, so can you give me the presentation? I sure can. All right. So, let's see, what window do I use? There's so many windows here. So this is a, can, can you see my screen? Is it too small? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, is it big enough? <coughs> okay. I hope this is a, uh, a little bit. Can you see the screen now? Is yeah. it better? Okay. So uh, it's a very simple file. Uh, uh, I created, it's a C-based program and, and, and then uh, the file, the actual database is uh, 
obviously by the giving that beam. Um, so uh, you can run this by just type this. There are a couple of commands. Uh, you can type I to initialize the database to make it clean. Uh, you can do that. Um, and then uh, you can add IP and port pairs. Let's say you can add, you know, starting from IP 10.0.0.0, and you want to have a port base, like starting from port 1, port 2, 3, right? And, and then you say how many IPs I want to add, right? Uh, and you can say how many ports you want to add. Uh, so basically by saying three, it means that we're going to add for each of the IPs, a million IPs, we're going to add port one, port two, port three uh, to that database. So we're going to have a million IPs plus uh, four, uh, three million IP port pairs, right? four million symbols. So we're going to add, enter. You can see that it takes like 0 0.3 seconds to add all of them. And you can do search. Like, you know, you can say, okay, uh, that one, that two, that three, uh, do I have port uh, one, right? You can say yes, exist, which is not surprising. And then you can say as three and two, does it exist? Yes. And, and, and then you can say, let's say the point is I want, I want to do as three, it's going to exist. Now if I do four, right? So one, two, three, and then four, you can say it doesn't exist because it was not part of the group. And you can also list uh, things like, uh, you know, I want to see all the ports associated with a particular IP. So you can type P and then type one, one, three. And you say, okay, port three, two, one is listed in some order. Uh, and you can add some additional ones here. For example, 10.1.2.3.4. Uh, and you can add, uh, you know, 100. Starting from port 100, and you want to add one IP. Uh, you want to add, uh, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, three ports, right? So let's say one, two, three. Okay, so you see that we added three ports, and then when we do search for ports associated with IP, those new ports showed up. So if you can exit. You can type H to, to find the you know, existing commands and quit, Q to quit, and then you can actually run that again. And you can say p uh, 10.1.3, so it will show up. It's a persistent database. So, so is, is this just a linear search? No, it's quick. It's, it's a, a hash. There's a hash to your name, so it's very fast. When you insert, when you search. Okay. Even if you have so, no like, you're not going to see an increase in time. Like, you put in 10,000 IPs there, and notice that you are a, a million, whatever. Right. I notice you kept searching from the beginning of that list. Like, if you search from the end, is it going to change the time? Uh, so it's end of what end of the list of IPs? Yeah. Because yeah. if you're uh, if you're destroying it in a flat file, it would that would imply that the, the further down that list in that flat file it is, uh, the longer. I, it would I think take we the, can probably do some experiment. I I don't see. Uh, I don't expect it to have like a. Uh, so it's super fast, even if you pick any IP that we added and search for IP import, it's going to be equal. Well, that actually looks like that took longer than the other one you were searching for. Is it? it it's probably within the margin of error, to be honest with you. Yeah, but, uh, probably. Very cool, Jen. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to show two quick little things. One is a, a Metasploit Pro update. We had uh, a requirement to do some update for PCI 3, version 3.2. Um, and so this basically really only encompassed two main things from a Metasploit Pro perspective in terms of PCI compliance. One is the SSL scanner for our web application scanner needed to be updated uh, to both scan for the new versions of TLS and reflect the new guidance saying anything TLS 1.0 or older is no longer compliant and marked as a vulnerability. So rather than actually making you guys sit through a scan here, I'm just going to show real quick. If I scroll through here, you can see now that it starts doing tests for TLS 1v1 and TLS 1v2. And because this still has TLS 1v, uh, 1v0, 
uh, accepted on here. If we scroll all the way to the bottom of this particular scan, and anyway, there's the cert, uh, we can actually see we get a vulnerability warning saying that it's using a weak implementation of transport layer security. Uh, so that's one half of it. The other half is even even more simple, which is that uh, our report is now updated, our, our report collateral, I guess you'd call it, is now updated so that it actually says that it's PCI DSS version 3.2. So that's uh, the PCI compliance side of uh, Metasploit Pro. The other thing I was going to demo real quick uh, was some of the work in Ruby SMB that's been going on. Uh, SMB2, for SMB2, we can now list all files in a directory. Uh, and as a um, as I've been going through uh, this work for each functional bit, I've been creating these example scripts and putting them up in the repo so that people can uh, actually just run simple test scenarios. So if I just grab the example line here. Thanks, VM world. Um, go away. Thank you. No, that's not. Anyway, so uh, this script, we're going to pass it a target address, the credentials we're going to use, what share, and then what directory we want to list all the files from. Um, and, oh. Oh, no. Wah, wah, wah. Demo gods are cruel mistresses. Oops. So it's that last minute change. Oh, you, oh, you know what? I, I disabled SMB, because I'm working on getting this working in SMB1 right now. I think I disabled SMB2 on the, the VM. Also, where is my VM? There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I disabled SMB2. <laughs> Reboot. Um, yeah. Sorry. Part of test it. Part of testing for these things is also changing all of the settings on the target to make sure that we can handle all the different possible configurations, like SMB1 being disabled or SMB2 being disabled, and that it will seamlessly negotiate between them. Uh, and because the SMB1 list directory functionality isn't finished yet, that's why we ran into that particular error. Well, that's good. At least it shows it's legitimate. I mean, if it had worked, I would have been suspicious. What do you know at all? No, I wouldn't have known, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Try that again. There we go. So. We can see a listing of all the files in subdir1 on the test chair. We get the little hidden DS store file. We get the, for some reason, SMB still has like the dot and double dot files <coughs> in the file system. And then we can see our like hello world.txt. Um, and there's different information levels you can actually pull about files. Uh, in this particular example, we're pulling uh, the most detailed information level, but then we're just displaying like a, a couple of the dates and like the size on disk and things like that uh, for the files. And if I look back at, oops, I look back at this directory on here, you can see that those are indeed the actual files that are in that subdirectory. And if I wanted to one more might have to this in your listing. It shows mm -hmm. that it's .txt, .txt, .rtf. Yeah, uh, that's actually here. Um, that's actually intentional. Um, that is actually the way the files are are named. So I, I intentionally did this on a couple of the files. This one is actually testrtf.jpg.rtf.rtf. I wanted to make sure that we were parsing correctly weirdly named files because this is actually a common thing that Windows users do uh, is they screw up their file names. Um, 
So I wanted to make sure that there was no weird parsing errors that we got out of those those kinds of situations when I was testing it. Uh, and if I want to crit with the wall of text here, I actually have a bigger example. This one has uh, 250 temporary files of about 3K in size in it. So if I go back and I do subdir2, Oh no! Am I a liar? It looks like I found a bug. Oh no! They're, they're printing out of order. <coughs> Why are they printing out of order? That is a that is a weird problem. Um, I don't know why they're printing out of order, and I'll look into that. But you can if you actually as I scroll up here, you can actually see. Oh, I know. It's why lexical they're order. They're, they're doing it in lexical order. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Never mind. That totally makes sense. But you can see all 250 files uh, were enumerated correctly. And I created that directory just to make sure, because there's usually a maximum number of entries you can get back per packet per request response cycle. And I wanted to make sure that we could properly handle a scenario where you had a directory with lots and lots of files, and then it didn't die or fail to give you back some of the files. Um, so yeah. So that's uh, SME2. I'm working on uh, this one. Took a long time because we had to. I had to create a lot of data structures for the underlying file system information. Uh, hopefully, I'm working on SME1. Hopefully, that will take a lot less time to do now. Uh, as a result, and uh, then it will be on to some of the other like CRUD operations for files. And then the big thing, because I'm sure some of the people are dying to know on this call. Uh, the big thing after getting these basic file operations is getting named, <coughs> getting named pipes handled. Because mm -hmm. once we have named pipes uh, done correctly, we should be able to convert all of the other SMB auxiliary modules in Metasploit framework to use Ruby SMB. And then, yes, we will be able to say that for all practical intents and purposes, Metasploit framework supports SMB too. That's great. Uh, I, I know a lot of people have been asking about that ever since Ned Pyle started asking on Twitter. Um, so as soon as all of those file operations are going to make sure name pipes should basically behave just like files, but there could be some weirdness around it. Once we have name pipes working, that's when every auxiliary module that hasn't been converted yet in framework can be converted. Uh, and at that point, those are the only things we will convert because exploits for SMB are version specific anyways. So at that point, when that's done, that is when we will be able to say Metasploit Framework is SMB2 uh, capable or compliant. Great work. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and maybe uh, about that time, we can also have we'll have the SMB named pipe meta interpreter support also bundled in, and we'll, we'll do end to end. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. All right. So I think thank you very much, Dave. I think we have one more. Who should Chris, I make Chris, the presenter? He's, like, he's on the call. Chris. All right, Chris. Can you hear me? I'm making you the presenter. Lowercase Chris. Hello. Send present and download request. Yeah. Well, I send him a present, so. I mean, you saw that it's pretty much instant. Can you see anything? All right, we see a really, really wide desktop, Chris. Okay. Yeah, it shows both of your desktops stitched together. Okay. If he's talking, all three. Three. All three oh, three, yeah. If he's talking, we can't hear him. And you need to unmute your microphone, too. Yeah. I did. Uh, Although, you send the audio through the TV, right? Oh, yeah. That might actually be why we can't hear him. Test, test. We can hear you now, Chris. Sorry, it was my fault. Go ahead. Okay. What, 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 what do you see? Because I don't. It doesn't even show me what what I see. All three of your desktops stitched together, side to side to side. Ah. Uh. <laughs> You're the Linux desktop. We. I I don't fix that. Does anybody care? I can I just demo anyway, right? <laughs> well, we can't see anybody care. It's gonna be smoke and mirrors. Ah. Uh. All right, let me see if I can fix that by just doing this. The demo works, believe me. Are you going to like unplug your screen? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Your extra desktops and then restart the. Well, depending on how we add to unplug the. I'll just squeeze. Like, it's in the wrong part. Like, you. Medical. 
I never had to. Yay! It looks great. Wow. Go for it. Woo! All right. All right. Here we go. So, uh, so I was tasked with uh, MSF Red kind of demo where, where it, what, what the vision was, was to have uh, all the Red members of a team connect to one endpoint, one data service endpoint, and being able to see all data that everybody, everything that everybody else is doing through one view. Um, this isn't a very exciting demo because it only shows host data right now. Me and Dev, Dev Mohanty was working on the UI side of it for uh, showing host and session, and it was part of like task one. So, without further ado, um, in in, uh, in AWS, we built uh, three little services here. Um, one to one to display, one to handle web requests, uh, one to handle the console data, um, which either gets data to the console or posts an SNS topic, and and then the data service itself. I actually ended up uh, dog fooding the MSF DB stuff that I wrote for in Ruby for the data service, so I could I can demo that real quick too. So uh, if I could find where that stuff is, oh, here it is. So I'll fire up my services real quick. Um, which one is this? Console service. So this is, this is the console service, which is what the um, consoles will talk to. And then there is the, oh, this is the Metasploit. So I, I, ended, so I ended up cloning my, my Metasploit project here. And uh, I wrote a little uh, thing that, that exposes the data service, the data store, the Metasploit data store through uh, web requests. So I found that guy up here. Uh, uh, that guy starts. And, and then it's the web. Okay, yeah. It's all three of those services found. And if I head over to. Uh, math, but that's okay. Hey, and that and that shows now uh, our our hosts and and we actually created a web socket to show live hosts as people discover things in Metasploit. So now I will connect to this data service with my Metasploit instance. Let's make this a little small. Uh, no. There we go. I'll start the uh, Metasploit and then uh, I added a, um, a function to add this uh, remote endpoint as a data service. So a data service, console service, when I put Arthur God to that. And it added it as a data service. If, and I can I can know it added it because if I go to my data service in an Amazon, I can see it requested the, uh, the workspace data. So I got the workspace path. And from here, it actually works just like it would uh, if you connected to your local Postgres through here, but but it's through it's through proxies. So if I do stuff like hosts, it will list all the host data um, for that for that guy. And um, that, that, and if I report if I report host data, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, you'll notice the web socket immediately picked up the, um, the input to the host. And that's it. That's that's all I got for demo so far. Oh, well, that's fantastic, Chris. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions about? Actually, before uh, we kind of wrap things up, I was wondering if anyone else had had something to demo, or anyone had any questions for any of the demoers. Nope. All right. Well, it looks like uh, this is a pretty successful demo session. I appreciate all the stuff. I'm really looking forward to seeing that name type stuff, Dave, and all the SMB2 stuff. Um, Lily, the items looked fantastic. Um, uh, and uh, I really can't wait to get my hands on this MSF DB stuff. So, um, all right, cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Woo!